the politics in Ireland is certainly changing, you know, with Sinn Féin now leading the main opposition. Um, I suppose, Alan, this time last year in the UK, the British electorate were going to the polls or they had just gone to the polls and we saw the, the crashing down essentially of the Red Wall in the North and you've talked there a little bit earlier on about the double edge of the economic issues from COVID and from Brexit and about the, the ambition that Boris Johnson sort of set out um, that did win him those seats. How would you assess, obviously the pandemic has completely thrown everything up in the air, but how would you assess um, his first year in office in number 10? Well, in some ways, this was the worst possible year that Boris Johnson could have had because it confronted him with precisely the sort of crisis that in many ways he's least equipped to deal with. It's a crisis that required sensible, consistent, evidence-based policy for which he's never been all that uh, famous. And, you know, you see throughout the pandemic where his, 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 almost his character got in the way. You can see it from the start, you know, he's always wanted to be upbeat. So every message about lockdown has ended with, whether it's will be done by Christmas or the sun uplands are coming, only to disappoint down the line. We saw it right at the start when he boasted about having shaken hands with loads of people in a hospital where loads of people had COVID. You know, on the very day that his scientific advisors were saying, we need to be socially distanced. Uh, he struggled with uh, being consistent and coherent. It strikes me though it's too early to say that one of the problems with the way we've approached COVID in this country has been a very sort of yo-yo uh, approach, which has been we lock down, we open up. And as we're opening up, the Prime Minister talks about us being free and encourages to go to Pret as many times as possible. Uh, uh, so it's it's been a difficult crisis, a difficult year for him, I think, because this isn't what he wanted the job to be able to do. I think all the I'm, I'm amazed by the number of people who are saying, you know, he'll be out of office soon because I don't necessarily see that. I think the public. Well, let me say two things. I think on the, fir the first place, the public has a degree of sympathy for national leaders during a time of pandemic. Uh, and his polling is holding up remarkably well. He's still polling at 40%. He's still sort of neck and neck, if not slightly ahead of the Labour Party, which is remarkable, even though his personal ratings have plummeted. But the second thing, and I can't stress this enough, is politics is going to change fundamentally next year, because as we emerge from the public health crisis, we are going to enter the post-COVID economic crisis. And economists are talking about two to three million people unemployed. That's a game changer. And ultimately, whatever's happened this year, ultimately, the fate of the government, I suspect, is going to hinge on how effectively it is seen to have tackled that problem, because that's what's going to be in people's minds in three years' time. Uh, and as at the moment, I'm, I'm not convinced the government has anything approaching a plan to deal with that unemployment crisis. We talked a lot about short-term measures, whether it's eat out to help out or you know, the furlough scheme, all those sorts of things. And actually the treasury acted very, very quickly and rather well at the first lockdown, less well thereafter, I'd have to say. But there's been precious little talk so far of what the government intends to do to address the employment crisis we have about to hit us. And the other thing I would say about this government, and again, this perhaps reflects the temperament of the prime minister is, Long-term strategy for them involves sort of what are we going to do before Friday? Uh, it's a very, very short-term reactive government at the moment. And maybe that's inherent in the nature of the pandemic and will change next year as things settle down to something more approaching normal. But I can't shake the feeling that this is a, a, a government that you know, lives by the seat of its pants and is not going to prove particularly good when it comes to looking at the medium to long-term. And I suppose it's, it's very different, Tom, to what's happened in the UK in terms of Boris Johnson's government's handling of COVID-19. And then he is the one who's sort of in power and has to deal with all the fallout from that. Whereas Trump is very different. You know, his mishandling of the pandemic now needs to be picked up and cleaned by, by the incoming Biden administration. Um, how, how did you sort of assess his, I mean, obviously it's well documented some of the failings, but the level of failing, how did you sort of assess that living there, living through it? Yeah, you know, I mean, you're, you're totally right. I mean, Biden is going to come into office with sort of an unprecedented, you know, crisis. Um, obviously there was a big crisis the last time a Democrat took office and the financial crisis, but in, in the run up to that, 
there was a lot of cooperation between the Bush team and the Biden team, or sorry, the Obama team. There's been virtually no cooperation, you know, on the pandemic between the two. The Biden team can't even really get information on how the vaccine's going to be distributed. Um, they're able to talk to officials now as of a few weeks ago, but um, the information flow is still very limited. And, you know, he's going to take office on January 20th, when by some estimates, the number of fatalities every day could be close to 4,000 people. Um, and that will continue throughout February. So, you know, that that is bleak by any sort of description. So his first challenge will really be to try to reset everything to do with COVID to build sort of a national consensus. And he, you know, he has limited power because a lot of it lies in the state. So he'd have to try to use the bully puppet um, to do that. And then to all the stuff Anand was talking about in terms of the next phase next year, that's where they'll have quite a bit of agency. But, you know, I think Trump's performance to me is different and qualitatively worse um, than the prime minister's, if only because, you know, as the year progressed, he just lost all interest in even pretending, you know, to want to deal with it. And so it was allowed to sort of just accumulate and to run amok. Um, you know, there are, of course, you know, there's a very legitimate feeling in all countries, you know, worry about lockdowns and a desire to get back to normal life. And he sort of tapped into that. And that's a very legitimate sort of natural visceral instinct. Um, but even if you do that, I think you also have an obligation, you know, to give accurate public health advice and to, to really try to do your best to protect the, the country. And all of that was completely failing. And the other point, Dara, I just make in closing is that, you know, I'm writing this book with a, 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 a co-authoring this book at the moment on COVID and the international response. And we've done a lot of research into sort of the US case. And it sort of surprised me that there was a lot of people on Trump's team from a very early stage that sort of said the right things internally, warned about it, you know, brought it to him very early. You know, this wasn't really an institutional failure, right? It was really an individual failure. And I know that can sound sort of overly simplistic because we're always looking for sort of structural explanations, but I, I think it's very hard to exaggerate his sort of personal impact um, on this in a, in a negative way. Yeah, well, I mean, fascinated to, to, to read that book because that's, I mean, that's, that's sort of what we were hearing about it, that, you know, the warning signals were there. And likewise in the UK, you know, there was obviously some media reports of, 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 of Prime Minister Johnson not attending uh, you know, very high level meetings that he perhaps should have been and so on. So that's, it's very interesting how at the very top that can um, have a detrimental impact. And Shane, i just ask you about, I mean, you heard um, Anna and there talking about some of the economic consequences that may lie down the line in terms of the unemployment levels. Um, how, how would you assess sort of, you know, looking first at Ireland and how we responded, as, how the Irish government responded um, to economic and social challenges of COVID uh, internationally compared with the UK and even the US? Sorry, Shana, that was to you. Apologies. Sorry, my connection went out. Thank you. No, could, do, you mind, do you mind just repeating the first part? Yeah, of I'll repeat that. Yeah, yeah. Just, just on, Anand, Anand mentioned that, um, you know, we could see two to three million unemployed in the UK. Um, I just wanted to, to get your view on, on the Irish government's you know, initial economic and social response and how that might compare with what we've seen in the UK and the US. Thanks. Um, I think the government did a good job initially. I, I think they did the right things. I, um, and, I, and, I, and I have to commend them for that. And I would still probably would use a similar argument to what um, Anand said earlier in that they, they did the right cuts at the right time and they've so they were not in a weak position. They were in a strong position financially going into the um, pandemic. It's an economic consequences. My concern is going forward if the, um, there's some structural problems in the Irish economy. There is a, there's too large of a low wage um, economy in Ireland. You, you compare it to other small economies. Uh, there's the, it's a segregated economy where you have the multinationals in an elite workforce that's drawn from all over Europe or all over the world. And then you have hospitality and tourism and some farming and fishing and other industries that rely on low wages um, and probably a lot of informal labor, like let's say the Brazilian community in Ireland. 
and that like if you look at just the meat processing um, industry as an example of what's going wrong you have a, a low wage not very well protected workforce that's been a spreader for for the virus because they have poor living conditions and poor working conditions and my concern is going forward that that question will be pushed aside and we'll go back to the same problems but it's not going to go away with brexit because I mean, that's the, the Brexit's going to hit those industries. It's the the multinationals would be fine, but agriculture and hospitality and small businesses that are struggling and, and pay sometimes really low wages, like pay the minimum wage, and you don't have job security, they're going to be affected by Brexit. So I'm hoping that the government is going to be thinking about the structural aspects of of the crisis as well as just short term. On a related note, Shane, I suppose I can uh, put this to you as well. You, you mentioned some of the structural issues and some of the short-term fixes have, have uh, you know, served their purpose, but you know, we need longer-term thinking to address those structural fixes. Um, political editor of the Irish Times, Pat Leahy, in a recent column, uh, name-checked Task, and he referred to as a left-wing economic think tank, and um, he referred to the findings of one of your reports around um, rising inequality and how Ireland didn't conform to international trends. Um, can you briefly tell us why Ireland doesn't conform to those international trends? And do you think that the people of Ireland would be surprised to learn that? Um, Ireland is, does a really good job of redistributing income through its tax system. I mean, it's, it's not as progressive as, as the government, the successive governments may have said it is, but it does a good job of redistributing income. Um, and so I don't think in some ways people will be surprised because they know about the tax system here. And w in general, like wages have been going up. And that was Seamus Coffey has made that argument repeatedly over the, the um, economist over the past couple of months. And he's also sort of addressing task. But um, the problem is that income inequality has limited explanatory power. You also need to think about what that income purchases. And Ireland has a really high cost of living and housing is out of reach for younger generations. I think in addition to income inequality, you're, we're gonna have to increasingly think about intergenerational inequality. And we're also gonna th have to think about what that income purchases in terms of not just housing, but also the fact that Ireland doesn't have universal primary care. So. Anecdotally, I know lots of particularly young people who won't go to the doctor because they can't afford it. That initial 60 euro visit, you know, are I, I find even with my own income, which is the top 10%, you know, I'm thinking, do I really want to do this because I know I have to pay for it? I came from the NHS in the UK, where for all of its problems, it's a, it's a magnificent institution because you just walk in, you don't pay for it, and um, and you know, and you get really good health care, at least for the you know, for right now. So I think it's a limited story and to fixate on income inequality to describe what's going on in Ireland is um, it's going to have very limited in, impact on policymaking. Policymakers need to think about the whole picture, which includes access to health and access to housing. Thank you very much, Shana. Um, there's a couple of questions coming in. Um, any, any attendees watching in, please continue to send in your questions. Um, Aoife, I just wanted to turn to you on, on the issue of Brexit. And sorry we're sort of jumping from issue to issue, but um, you're a Derry native, and what have you made of Northern Ireland sort of being at the centre of, of Brexit over the last number of years, and, and, and how have you seen it from, from sort of a Northern Ireland perspective? Uh, yeah, so I think like most people in Northern Ireland, um, we can kind of laugh about how we seem to be a pain in the side of the British government and a pain in the side for the Irish government. Um, I think, you know, in Brexit, and it was made very clear to people on the island of Ireland uh, what Brexit would mean for the North and, you know, for the Republic. And I think, you know, anyone would agree that the lack of knowledge from the British government side about the, the impact of Brexit would have on the North was quite stark. I think there was a lot of debate at the time avoid it but it became incredibly clear that the politicians either had very short memories or did not know enough about Northern Ireland to be advocating for a Brexit that they didn't know how it would affect the North. So yeah I think you know the Irish government, um, successive Irish governments now deserve credit in the way that they've handled Brexit you know and the EU I don't think anyone 
could have said they really expected as much EU solidarity as we got. You know, it became very clear that the EU was behind Ireland all the way and, you know, and behind the peace process all the way. And I think that was really, really heartening. I don't think anyone expected any different, but, you know, we'd heard a lot in the, you know, the Daily Express and the Telegraph about how, you know, the EU were going to lean on for Edgar and lean on Coveney and that just never happened. There never seemed to be any falter there, but it doesn't surprise people in Northern Ireland because we are, we often see that other states, whether it be the Republic or Britain, don't really understand the North that well. And I think the border issue was such a, a, like a really emotional issue for people on both sides of it. And as someone who lives on the border and my dad works in Donegal, so he crosses the border six, eight times a day. Um, you know, it became very personal and people became very, very afraid, you know, when there were talks of border posts and checkpoints and, you know, I grew up, there were still border posts and checkpoints around when I was growing up, so, and I'm not that old. So I think, yeah, it became um, quite clear from the British side especially that there was not enough knowledge about Northern Ireland, about how Northern Ireland trades, about how Northern Ireland works and about the communities there. And I think, a lot of people were very let down by Brexit, especially because Northern Ireland obviously voted to stay. Um, and I think that vote was very much based in the fact that people in Northern Ireland knew what was best for them. And we knew that Brexit would have been bad for Northern Ireland in a state that already has a minor problems with poverty and inequality. You know, I am dreading any kind of recession coming to the North because it's, I can't imagine how bad it's going to get because in the last recession, because of where the North is situated, we kind of got both sides of it. So you kind of feel after effects from both sides of the border on in recession. And I feel like this is going to be the same. So yeah, I think a lack of understanding <laughs> from both sides, but mostly from the British side, I don't think many people were surprised. Thanks very much. A um, couple of questions coming in. I'm just going to go to the audience questions now. Some of them are directed at specific speakers, but if you, if you want to jump in, uh, please do. Um, Anna, the question for you um, comes in, and, and it's how do you think or how difficult do you think it will be to rebuild sort of the Dublin-London relationship, and has that been damaged throughout this Brexit process? And they also throw in, um, you know, given we are coming up to the centenary of Northern Ireland, you know, the establishment of the North, um, will, will these relations be able to be sort of rebuilt over the, over the coming months and years? Well, I think it's obvious that relations between Dublin and London have been affected. I mean, you simply needed to listen to the tone of voice when the internal market bill was introduced into the European Parliament of people in Dublin to, to get that that was offensive, apart from anything else. Uh, can they be rebuilt? Yeah, absolutely. But uh, it depends on lots of things. It depends on how seriously the British government take their commitment to Northern Ireland. Uh, and it depends on how well the Northern Ireland Protocol works. There are hopes among some people that if the Northern Ireland Protocol can be made to work well, Northern Ireland will enjoy the best of both worlds. That is to say, it'll have more or less unfettered access to the GB market and trade with the European Union as well. In fact, when it was being negotiated, one of the interesting sort of uh, pushbacks on the EU side was from, for a short while, there were some in some member states who resisted the Northern Ireland Protocol because they, they feared that Northern Ireland would become a manufacturing hub uh, enjoying investment from both sides. Now, obviously, the debate in the last few weeks and months hasn't been about that. It's been about the constraints imposed on businesses in Northern Ireland. But if, if the UK government in particular plays this well, you could end up with a pretty good outcome for Northern Ireland. Uh, and that, of course, will help in terms of relations with between London and Dublin as well, because what we all want is security, stability and prosperity in both parts of the island. And that would help. So that is key to me in terms of relations going forward. I think it's absolutely true that the people in GB in general don't understand Northern Ireland. What is even sadder in a way is how the Brexit process has revealed that many people in GB don't really care about Northern Ireland either way. You hear the reaction to some of the polling about possible border polls in, in GB and it really is quite depressing, particularly when we have a government 
by a party that calls itself the Conservative and Unionist Party, though it seems quite often to forget the second bit these days. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Eva, do you want to respond to that or any, any thoughts on that one? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think, you know, the DVP, um, for one thing, are, going to, are, are struggling and going to struggle um, with their voters and, I feel, and they feel very let down um, by Boris and, you know, that old saying um, from John Hume about how you can't eat a flag. I don't think I, there's been any other time other than the peace process where that was more apt. And I think, you know, this notion of a border down the Irish Sea is incredibly disappointing for certain communities in Northern Ireland. But the other issue was during Brexit, this was all flagged at the time and the DUP put a lot of stock and a lot of faith in Boris Johnson. Like we all remember the scenes of him arriving at the DUP um, convention, the you know, cheers and singing and stuff. And it was, I think anyone who studied Boris Johnson would know that you're not supposed to put a lot of stock in the promises that Boris Johnson makes to you. And I think the DUP have learned that the hard way. I mean, not just arriving, but arriving and swearing blind that he wouldn't do what he did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Tom, a couple of questions coming in for you on the foreign policy uh, side of things. Um, one is from a colleague at the Institute, Ross Fitzpatrick. Um, Obama with Biden at his side oversaw intervention in Libya, um, disastrous involvement in Yemen, occupation Afghanistan, support for coup in Honduras, um, and more. Um, as he continues to fill his cabinet with many of the same advisors, um, what reason is there to believe that U.S. foreign policy under Biden will be different to that of um, Obama? Was there a second one as well? You wanted me to? Yes, I'll turn that in as well. Um, it's very similar. Um, how do you think Biden's foreign policy will differ from Obama's? Uh, will he be more assertive or continue to be a polite, orderly caretaker of America's decline? Right. Yeah, no, great question. So on, on the first one, you know, I think, I mean, to me, I think there's been a pretty big shift on interventionism in that the, the Biden team, I think, is very skeptical of large scale uh, or really any sort of major military interventions and does not want that to define their foreign policy. I think they're looking for ways to withdraw from Afghanistan. Uh, if you look at what Biden has said about Saudi Arabia, you know, it consistently over time has been a lot more negative um, than many others. And he's been very critical of Mohammed bin Salman and for many Democrats, there's sort of unfinished business there with the murder of Jamal Khashoggi and a number of other provocations um, by Riyadh. So, I, I, you know, I think there'll be a coolness there, which will be definitely reflected, I would guess, in the, in the Yemen uh, war. Um, you know, I think on the other side of it, um, there's always this sort of, be, you know, just being totally honest, like I think there's this uh, uh, back and forth in terms of, you know, the ISIS dimension, right? So uh, Obama left Iraq and then ISIS came back and then they had to go back in. So if there is a debate and intervention, I think it will be on sort of that question about how do you sort of prevent conditions from emerging, you know, whereby overnight Congress and both parties would basically be advocating for the U.S. to go back in if there was an attack on the US or on its allies uh, from ISIS. So, but I think for the most part, I think you will see um, the debate really shift uh, to be much more skeptical of intervention and focus on other issues, uh, particularly the global economy and China. And that brings me on to the second question from Keen there, which I think is a really important one because you know we sort of know how Biden will be really different to Trump but we don't really know how it'd be different from Obama. Um, and that's sort of interesting, just analytically. Um, you know, I think there's sort of two groups uh, within the Biden world. There's a group that will be happy to continue sort of the worldview that President Obama had updated for events. Um, so pretty cautious, a little skeptical of, of the use of American power, more balanced uh, approach to China, um, you know, wanting to play this role in the Middle East, um, probably pretty supportive of an open global economy and globalization. And then you have sort of a second group, um, and many of them are officials in the Obama administration, who sort of question key assumptions or orthodoxies from that period, particularly on China and the global economy and traditional free trade agreements and the like. 
um, because they think the world has fundamentally changed and because they think it's important to address some of the root causes of you know, citizens' anxiety about the global economy and, and the world sort of as a whole. Uh, and both those groups, I think, are represented in the administration now. And, and oh, you could see Biden sort of going in either direction. So I think that's something to watch. I think it's a little premature to say it's definitely going to be one way or the other. But my guess will be that it will be fairly different to Obama just because the world has you know, changed pretty dramatically. And I think you know, the, 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 there's enough people there, including the president-elect, who sort of understand that the American people have to be convinced that the foreign policy of the country is actually you know, reflecting their interests and, and improving their livelihoods uh, pretty directly. Shane, have you anything to add on that um, in terms of what we might see as differences? I know Thomas sketched out there the sort of two camps that are emerging within the Biden um, administration when it comes to foreign policy. Have you any, any, anything further to add? I think domestic policy will actually be uh, really interesting in how he differentiates himself from Obama if he does, um, because I don't think he can go back to what o Obama, I, I think he will try to add, or he'll try to alter health policy to try to make it more progressive. He's committed to that. And I think he will do that in light of the pandemic. Um, but I, I hope, I, I think he he will be far more ambitious in terms of climate change because we haven't really talked about that. But beyond Brexit or beyond COVID, the next ten years will be all about climate change. And so, I think that uh, for me, um, uh, Biden might orient his foreign policy as well as his domestic policy, and with that sort of economic investment in a in the sagging economy. Um, and creating jobs in fighting climate change. And I think he'll try to position the U.S. as a leader in that area. He'll have some resistance, and he, if he doesn't have the Senate, it might be a bit difficult. But I don't know how difficult, because I, I think the Republican-dominated states are also going to need to create jobs, considering the effect of COVID in those states. So that's where I would be most interested, and I think that's where he will distinguish himself, just because the world's moved on since Obama. Very good, thank you. Um, question here um, from Hannah, and she asks um, to you, Eve, at the start, um, what do you think about the possible rise of the far right in Ireland, um, specifically around sort of anti-COVID, anti-maskers? Um, you know, do you think there's, there's any sort of scope there in the medium to long term arising from COVID? Yeah, the Irish Examiner are actually doing an investigation about this over Christmas. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it's something um, we should be wary of. Um, I'm due to speak to the Minister for Equality this week, and we know, you know, Roger O'Gorman, the Minister, was also targeted by the far right, along with um, Fenton Warfield, another openly gay um, member of the Araptists. So, we've seen how. Um, terrifying. I thought that rally against Roger Gorman was one of the most jarring things I've seen in a way. And I think in COVID, we know how people get linked into conspiracy theories. You know, it comes from a sense of vulnerability. It comes from inequality. It comes from recession. These are all the instances where people become very vulnerable to conspiracy theories. And in COVID especially, you know, we've seen a lot of misinformation, probably less so um, than they have in America. But for a small country, you know, we have all have a, have a family member who has shared some absolutely bizarre Facebook post, whether it's like it tends to be <laughs> your aunties and uncles, but um, aunts or uncles or, you know, family members sharing like the most bizarre stuff about masks, about lockdown, about 5G. And I think there is, it is definitely something we need to be concerned about. I think we could be doing more in terms of uh, teaching, especially at a younger age, you know, avoid equality in schools. We have a massive issue with anti-traveler racism in this country and, 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 it's a, and all kinds of racism we have issues within the country. And I think more could be done at an earlier age. I think the, the downside to that is the people we see now sharing the anti-mask conspiracies and stuff like that tend to be older. There's a digital literacy problem there. Um, I've read quite a lot about it in the last couple of weeks about how older people using Facebook and Twitter, you know, they're not as on it as we are all the time. So then they're not 
picking up things that we would pick up on so we could say that's not true that's fake news and i think what i find incredibly strange i don't know if ironic is the right word but people often say to me in a kind of rude way like i don't believe anything that i read in the papers but then they'll say something to me and i'll say that's not true where did you hear that and they'll say well, i read it on facebook so we have a long way to go in terms of like rebuilding trust in media and i think it when we come into a recession now in ireland we're headed for one i think we need to be incredibly alert to how insidious these things are we were lucky in a way in the last recession that targeting of different uh, immigrant groups didn't really take hold as it did in other countries when it was under recession but we're not going to be lucky every time i think there's going to have to be a lot done in the meantime and i don't think we have done enough I know there are different websites and newspapers that have done fact checking and that's like essential when it comes to COVID but I think yeah I think the far right is something that we should be worried about and as we head into another recession with a lot of youth unemployment I think it is something that we would need to be concerned about. Yeah and look I'm conscious we're coming towards the end of the discussion and I don't want to spend the last couple of minutes talking about the potential rise of the far right in Ireland um, after what's been a pretty difficult year already but um, Shana and Tom and even Annan from your studying of, of, of Europe, um, Ireland has sort of bucked the trend in terms of you know Western democracies not having a sort of a big foothold of the far right um, you know, we did experience a really severe recession post-2008 financial crisis. Um, what would you put that down to, Shana? How did we not succumb to that? And, um, you know, I don't want to spend the last five minutes talking on this, but I mean, do you, do you have any sort of ideas why why we, we didn't go down that route? Uh, I think the last recession you had immigration as an outlet, people could leave, and it was an, it's an accepted way of dealing with economic depression here in Ireland. And then um, I also think that Ireland's history is unique um, because it's other countries are becoming more conservative. Ireland is becoming more liberal. So I, I think that that helps. And finally, um, you do have a nationalist populist party, but they're left leaning. Um, and that's that they're not there's, there's no equivalent to Sinn Féin in other countries. Tom, any thoughts on that? You know, having sort of lived through Trump and, and watching sort of the far right movements pop up in in Europe. Yeah, no, look, I agree with what Shana said there, actually, those three points. I, I think also, you know, as a small um, sort of open country that sort of relies or has relied for, you know, many decades now on sort of interconnection with the rest of the world um, and has this history of, of immigration as well. I think that's hugely sort of culturally significant in terms of how people look out. Now, look, it's not as if people aren't, you know, dissatisfied um, with the political status quo, but I think you you both have sort of Sinn Féin as an outlet for that to some extent, and then also all of these independents, which are really, you know, a function of, you know, the Irish electoral system. I mean, in a country like Germany, you need to meet a 5% threshold of votes in the country as a whole. Um, so whereas, uh, whereas in the Irish system, you know, people can vote for that local sort of candidate who's wanting to express their sort of dissatisfaction with how things are going. So I think all of that um, has sort of helped, but I agree, you know, not to be uh, complacent. And I think the next couple of years, you know, will be sort of a challenge just in, for the whole world really, and just recovering from COVID and doing so in a way that, um, you know, that is seen as sort of fair and equitable and also you know, really dealing with a, a once in a century sort of economic crisis that has come from a once in a century pandemic. And Alan, just to, to bring you in on this point, and we'll finish up on, on the sort of the far right. Um, there has been, you know, sort of a backlash to the, the, the Black Lives Matter movement in the UK. We've seen only in the last couple of weeks, um, you know, football players taking the knee and being booed as the fans have come back into stadiums. Um, you know, how, how worried should we be of that trend, um, not just in the UK, but, but more, more broadly? Well, for a moment, I thought you were planning to humiliate me by asking about Irish politics in front of an Irish audience. I was going to pretend my signal had gone <laughs> at that point. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think a lot depends on what the government does. One of the interesting things about politics in the UK at the moment is it's turned on its axis. So actually, we no longer have politics that's structured by the left-right divide. If you think that 82%, I think, 
of Conservative voters last December were Leaf supporters. What you have now is a sort of identity divide that structures our politics. Uh, you have sort of social liberals who vote for the Labour Party, social conservatives who vote for the Conservative Party. The danger, I think, particularly given the economic problems that are going to confront us and the divisions within the Conservative Party over economic solutions to those problems, is that the government resorts to the language of identity. That is to say that the government thinks, how do you hold together a values coalition with very different economic interests? You don't talk about economics, you talk about values. To date, despite the comparisons made between him and Donald Trump, Boris Johnson has been relatively restrained on this. He was quite quiet on the statues thing, uh, in the Black Lives Matter protests. He could have played on that a lot more. He's actually liberalized some aspects of our immigration policy. It's gone largely unnoticed, but this points-based system gives opportunities to people from outside the EU. And you know, the British people have become more liberal about uh, immigration since 2016. So for me, the ultimate danger is a government that plays culture politics. Uh, if the Conservatives decide because of their own internal divisions that that's a way to keep their voters together, then we're in for problems, I think. If they don't, if Boris Johnson, and we don't know what sort of Boris Johnson we'll get next year, if he is more of the sort of liberal mayor of London, Boris Johnson, and less of the, less of the head of vote leave Boris Johnson, then actually I'm relatively relaxed for the moment. Okay, okay, thanks very much. Um, to wrap up, just, just one question to everybody. Um, was there anything at all worth celebrating in 2020? And um, that's a question that's come in. Was there was there anything worth celebrating? And if there wasn't, um, do you have any hopes for next year? And you can't say vaccine because I think we all hope for that one. Um, Tom, I'll start with you. Was there anything worth celebrating? And if not, what, what are your hopes for next year? Yeah, well, uh, apart from the obvious about the election as I was talking about earlier, which I think was a very non-2020 way to end 2020. So that, that was a huge relief uh, over here. But I think setting aside politics, you know, a difficult year, I think, for everyone. But really great to be, you know, I think we've all learned how to connect with each other, you know, uh, online for events like this. You know, a year ago, you never would have and we never at Brookings would have basically had a, a, a partially virtual event where speakers would come in from around the world. So I think that, you know, has been a really positive change and will hopefully sort of continue. But I guess otherwise, you know, I'm just looking, really looking forward to getting back to Ireland next year. I think it's been the longest ever time that I haven't been back for, for a whole year and to be a year and a half. So that's what I'm looking forward to in 2021. Brilliant. Aoife, coming to you. Anything worth celebrating and what are you looking forward to next year? Well, I was supposed to get married this year, so hopefully I'll get married next year. <laughs> um, the only th I don't know if it's worth celebrating, but I am intrigued by the working from home issue now and how prevalent it becomes. And just in Ireland, we know the issue of the housing crisis and the issues around Dublin and the kind of city centres and, you know, these long commutes and the housing crisis and the rent prices keep going up. And I would like to think that as we come out of this pandemic, people will be more inclined to stay where they live and still be able to have good paying jobs that might be the multinational or whatever it is, might be based in Dublin, but they get to work from home. I just hope that it gives people more options. I think it would be essential for rural Ireland that we can get people staying in towns and villages. And I think if nothing else comes from COVID, if we just take that away that not everyone has to move to Dublin or Cork or Galway to get a job and just people have more options. And then that goes for childcare and, you know, cost of living and a million different things. But I would like to see, you know, if we get anything out of it, that if we could just let people have more options when it comes to work. I think that would be a good thing for us and a good thing for the environment. So that's all I'm taking from 2020. Brilliant. Shana, come to you. Um, I think the uh, vaccine gave me hope that um, actually people can coordinate around the world and, you know, there's government and private sector partnerships because, again, just to, go, to go back to climate change, I think we're going to need that kind of cooperation and that initiative. And the other side of that was was everybody cooperating to protect each other. I mean, not all we've heard about anti-vaxxers and protests against masks and certainly in the U.S. that's prevalent. Um, but I, I think there a lot of people did sort of change their behavior, and I think that's going to be necessary for climate action. So I, that gave me hope. Brilliant. The last word, Anand, to you. Anything worth celebrating, and what are you looking forward to? 
Well, at the risk of lowering the tone, and this is purely personal, I mean, Leeds are back in the Premier League. It's made my year. It yeah. has cheered me up so much, I'm slightly embarrassed. But that's been the best thing about my year so far. Uh, when will you get to go in and see them? Well, April the 4th is Leeds Man United. So we have it in the diary and we're hoping and praying that they'll let okay. us back in by then. Brilliant. Um, thanks very much to everybody for joining us. Thanks for the, the questions that were coming in throughout the night. And uh, really thank you all for your time this evening, um, giving up an hour. I know everyone's very busy and uh, really, really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you. See thank you all. Take Cheers. care. Bye -bye. Have a good Christmas. Same to you, Santa, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.